sure how it went. Um, it was definitely warmer. Um, I know I've known Greg, uh, Meg because she um, worked uh, pretty intensely with Greg Judy um, about mob stocking, and then all of a sudden she's back home in Buffalo. She's got a mob racing um, business, and she's also starting to work within this area on being your contact for. Um, she's trying to secure contract raisers folks that had their hands up to um, get cows on your farm. Um, what I will say is in this region, I forgot to mention this, Morgan brought it up. Um, right now in this, in this immediate area, if you want 20 minutes in a circle, there's about seven to 800 acres of grazable land, and a lot of it's under fence. Um, and talk to the um, Stephen Weaver and some of the folks today, Nathan, um, Jesse, um, they're they're looking to expand their grazing operations, not in dairy, but to do some contract grazing. So we got a pretty nice hub here. Um, sure, we'd love to have you in Madison County. Um, I'll pay our taxes. <laughs> so um, so with that, I'll bring Meg up, and um, uh, I've never heard Meg speak. Um, so uh, take it away. Okay, I know I'm in a bad spot here. I'm the last speaker before lunch, so kind of bear with me. So my name is Meg Griscovich. I am here kind of as two different people today. I'm here as myself. I run Rhinestone Cattle Company out of the Buffalo area. I'm a custom grazer. I do 100% grass-fed beef, and my aim is to eventually be a grass-fed seed stock provider. And I am also custom grazing this coming year for the other person that I'm here as, which is Rich Winter, my boss. He runs Shell Jerry Meats. That is a company based in the Catskills, selling meat to Fleischer's and a number of other clients in New York City. Rich is in sunny Mexico today, so I'm going to be talking against him too. I'll try not to confuse you too bad switching between the two different personalities. So, what I'm going to go over, first of all, why would you want to do this? Why would you want to get involved with somebody else as a business partner? When? You need to either own it or lease it. Finding customers to graze what a herd owner looks for and what a custom grazer looks for in a herd owner and what it's like on a daily basis to be a custom grazer. So there's a number of reasons, and some of them have been already mentioned, why you would want to get involved with this. First and foremost, I think are the economic reasons. For somebody like me, I'm a new farmer, first generation, I've been in business for two years. I definitely cannot go out there and spend 50 grand to buy a herd right off the bat. Even if I did have that kind of money, or if anyone would give me that kind of money, there is a lot of risk there between the two years for our grass-fed grass animals to go from birth until slaughter. So not only do you not have to pay up front to buy a herd, you don't have to take on that risk. That risk belongs to the herd owner. You also usually don't have direct expenses for a custom grazed herd. Now it's kind of hard to talk about this on a specific basis because contracts are so individual between the two different people involved. But as Rhinestone Cattle Company, I would never sign a custom grazing contract where I would have to provide any feed or veterinary products or anything to these animals. All I want to do is provide management, and the herd owner still has to pay for all the expenses. So if you're doing this, not only do you have a herd on your property that you're making money raising, but you don't have to provide the feed, or the mineral, or the shots, or anything else like that. Cash flow can be a lot more regular under a custom grazing setup than if you're just raising your own animals. Usually, if you're doing things on a commodity basis, you can pay once a year when you sell your calf crop, or once a year when you sell your meat. And usually, it's just one lump sum and one time, and the whole rest of the year, you got to meter that out. But under a custom grazing setup, the way that I do things at least, you can get paid, say, if you're doing stockers, once a month. If you have a scale, you can weigh your animals once a month and get paid for the gain that you put on that month. You can do a cash advance from some owners, so they'll pay you a certain percentage up front for just a certain amount, and that way you can use that to get through the whole rest of the season until you get the rest of your pay. So there's a number of creative cash flow structuring things that you can do if you have a cooperative owner and grazer working together. It can be much more beneficial for both people. Like I was talking about protection from risk, in our contracts, 
there is an acceptable death loss percentage. It's usually, I think, one cow per 40 or two calves per 40. So as long as you adhere to that amount of death loss, it doesn't affect you as a custom grazer at all. That still falls with the owner. But of course, there is a limit to that. If you lose 10 or 20 animals, there's going to be repercussions. But on a normal basis, you are protected from that death loss, much more than you would be if you were raising your own animals. Like I said, financial reasons. If you're working with a, another herd owner, you can almost enter into a partnership that goes above and beyond custom grazing, where that herd owner can help you cash flow and finance things like property setup. Say you, you tell your herd owner, well, you know, I'd love to take on your animals, but I need a pond or I need fence. I'm not set up, I don't have a handling facility. They can either help you pay for that and take that out of what they pay you, or they can give you a forgivable loan that you pay back, and they can help you out with that some way. You can trade barter services. So it's another cash flow and finance option as opposed to going straight to a bank or having the cash flow yourself. Especially if you're a young farmer, a new farmer, if you're starting up a new enterprise, this can really, really be a huge help. Like I said, new beginner farmers, wonderful opportunity, as was said before, probably the best opportunity out there for a young or new beginning farmer. It also gives you a chance to try out new genetics. Say, if you wanted to switch from conventional grain-fed to a grass-fed type of animal, you're not sure where to start, not sure what breed you really want, this will give you a chance to see how a certain type of animal or a certain breed will operate on your farm, and see if you like it, and see if it's going to work. It helps you get management experience to help you try out a new kind of enterprise if you're thinking about switching enterprises. But like was also said before, you do need to start with some kind of experience. So if you have none, my suggestion would be to go and be an intern for somebody or go and get a job as somebody's manager. That can help you get started and get some experience in a controlled environment. Same or higher profits can be made in custom grazing than if you have your own animals. A lot of people think, well, you know, I have to own my own animals in order to make anything. I can't make it on custom grazing. Here is an example, simplified economic scenario. At the top, we're going to talk about two farmers here. At the top would be the situation for both of those farmers if they were raising their own animals. We have 25 beef cows here, each of them own 25 cows. Let's say they're going to make about 20 grand every year selling their calves. But they both have to cover direct costs and overhead. So these are just numbers I'm throwing out there. Say direct costs, feed costs, and veterinary, that kind of thing, 300 bucks a head per year. And then we have an overhead arbitrary number of 6,000 bucks. A lot of people's overhead is way higher than this, but this is going to go with that. So profit 1,500 bucks for each of those two farmers for one year. Now say that they become enter into a custom grazing type of situation where one is the herd owner and one is the custom grazer. So the herd owner owns the cows, custom grazer runs them. And what the custom grazer owner has to pay is the fee per head per day. I just added a dollar here. And then they also cover the direct costs, which would be fees and veterinary. And so the herd owner, out of that 20000 they make from selling the calves, ends up with a profit of 33000 dollars which is higher than if he had his own cows and was raising them. The custom grazer here, the only thing that they make is the custom grazing per head per day revenue, but the only thing that they then have to cover is the overhead on their own farm, which they have total control over. And they end up also with a higher profit than if they were just trying to do everything themselves. It's kind of a side note here, everything works better on a low input type of farm. And if you're doing conventional or grass fed and custom grazing or raising your own, it doesn't matter. The more that you can cut your input costs, the more that you can work with nature, the higher your profit is always going to be. Well, you need land if you're going to do this. You have two options, obviously leasing or buying. Leasing, I think, is just a way better way to go, at least to start out. Cheaper, better for cash flow. You don't have taxes. You don't have. You don't have to go through a mortgage. You don't pay interest on it. So all you have to pay is the lease payment every year, or every month, however you set it up. People think that well, if I'm paying a lease payment. Why don't I pay a mortgage payment and then I own it? Flexibility comes into play. Say I'm a young farmer. I may not want to live where I live forever. I'm not sure I may even want to be in the farming forever. It gives you a lot more flexibility. It does not tie you down quite as much. It allows you to take your money, your free capital, whatever you can have, and put that into things that will give you a quicker, faster, better return on that investment, such as buying animals instead of just sinking it all into your land. You can, you can negotiate lease terms between you and the landholder. It gives you a lot more flexibility than working with a bank, where they pretty much tell you what to do. The contracts can be very simple. My land lease contract is one page. Lawyers look it over, but it's just really simple. Nobody gets scared. 
So I think leasing overall is the better way to go. In all the economic analysis I've done recently for my own business, I can always, always come out ahead of leasing rather than buying. But like I said, there is on the side so there's downsides. Yes, the flexibility can also be a bad thing. You can have leases yanked out from market if you have uncertainty. And you have to take into account what that landowner wants, what the other people who use the property want. It's got a necessary tool that you have to deal with. So in some situations, if you do have a lot of capital at your disposal, it might be a lot less stressful just to buy something. <coughs> How do you find land to lease? Now, let me start here by asking some of you out there what your experiences have been in finding land to lease. How did you come across the property that you are now leasing? A couple of volunteers. Yes, sir? The gentleman in the front says you people have approached him. That's great. That's the best way to do things. Anybody else? Well, I've heard most people say that this is their neighbor down the road that they go over and talk to. You know each other for a number of years. That's awesome. But if you don't have that kind of relationship with someone, if you're a new farmer or you just moved to the area, things are a lot harder. Or if you try to find land in a new place that you want to move to. I really turned a corner when I found my Sacagawea. His name is Scott. <laughs> he lives in Allegheny County where I decided two places. And he knows everybody down there. He spent there his whole life. He's friends with everybody. He grew up on a farm. So he went around and started talking to people and saying, hey, I got this friend who's a new farmer, highly trained in grazing and green cattle production. She was looking for land to lease. That was the only reason I found anything. I tried for two years going around my area and talking to people. I wasn't able to get anyone on the phone. Nobody would answer their door. So I just left pamphlets and notes on people's doors. People actually called the town hall and asked about the scam that's going around. <laughs>
Also, in terms of location, <laughs> our interstate provide? What's the accessibility of it? For people bringing cattle in and out, should we have cattle out? Is there a sale bar? Is there a fence? Can you get a truck and trailer down into the driveway into the loading area? Both a small pickup truck and trailer or a semi? And people, people are very, very important. <laughs> you need, we're going to talk a little more about this later on, evaluating your landowner before you sign the lease. Not just figuring out what kind of person they are, how easy they're going to be to work with, but who else uses the land? Who else is an owning partner? And who else is a hunter or a is in the house? Who else is allowed to be there? But going on to land features, soil and forage help. Definitely start with doing a soil test and possibly a forage test on the grass that's growing there. Not only is this a good place for you to know where to start, but you can use this as the is talking about a baseline for showing improvement in the land. You can show the landowner in a couple years, this is where we started, this is where we are now, and this is why I should be allowed to stay, why you should renew your lease. But, okay, so I look forward to help monitor that, see if you can do it any time. If you have a land piece that has not been used in a while, see if you can go out there and try to do an estimate of the forage that's growing and the forage that will be available. They'll help you with your stocking decisions. Infrastructure. Is there a corral? Is there a fence? Is there water? Is there a barn? Is there a winter shelter? Is there equipment that you might be able to use? All of this stuff is going to be very important economically in deciding whether or not it's worth it. And water. Water is the most important thing. To me, especially when I'm looking for a property, I can develop all kinds of stuff. But if there's no water and there's no source of water, it's not going to happen. So economic analysis. Once you've gone over the property and you've looked at all these things and you have all the information you need, you have to sit down and do some numbers. I hate numbers, they're scary, but I recently realized that I will never have a business unless I make these with them. So how long, most, most important question to me, how long until this property gets to its productive potential? If it's gonna be five or 10 years, but that's a lot of money that you're losing until you get up to that point. That you're gonna to have to fill in that cash flow somehow. You gotta make sure that you're gonna be able to survive. How much work is it going to take to get to top productivity? How much money are you going to have to spend to get there? How many animals are you going to be able to hold now and in the future? And is that going to be enough to pay for everything that you need? Return on investment for your starting costs. And also very importantly, overhead versus scale. There's a certain number of animals you need to be able to hold on a property in order to cover your cost to drive there every day. Your cost to run the ATV, to drive around it, whatever you have to do. So you need to make sure that you're going to be at a viable scale and make it work. That property that I gave up that was 45 minutes from my house, seven acres, I have three cattle on it, was not worth it at all. <laughs> have another side note. When I started a business out a couple of years, two years ago, I thought, well, I'm just going to start really, really small, seven acres, three cows, reinvest my earnings, work day job for a while, work my way up. But now I'm kind of getting in the mindset of go big or go home. Why should I wait five or 10 years to get to a commercial scale? Even if I have to do a little bit of creative business agreements with some people, I might have to borrow a little money here and there, it's probably a better idea just to get out to operating commercial scale right away and not mess around being small for so long. Landowner relations. This is the, definitely the toughest part of leasing and as custom grazing relations with your herd owner. You need to be able to figure out pretty quickly what kind of person they are. Later down the list, get references. This is probably the number one thing that I've messed up so far. If you're something that you don't know, talk to other people in the neighborhood. Talk to their neighbors, talk to people who work with them, their family, their friends. Talk to the bartender at the local bar. Find out what their reputation is and how business dealings between them and other people have gone in the past. This would have probably saved me a lot of trouble if I had done this. <laughs> if you need to, as far as your image, come across as being professional, but at the same time, not as real scary. A lot of people in farming are still old-fashioned. They don't, they're kind of freaked out by somebody who comes across as a big city businessman. Like I would say, all my professionally glossy printed business cards and panelists I left at people's doors, they thought it was a scam. It looked too good. <coughs> you need to be approachable, but at the same time, you need to let them know that you're serious about taking care of their animals and you're concerned with the success of their business, too. And sometimes you have a kiss one. <laughs> I found that out this year, too. I spent spending two years looking for land. I finally found a couple of properties. The one lady who I signed on with, she said, well, I'd love to give you this land. I want cattle on it, but the thing is, I want it fenced. Like, oh boy. <laughs> so I told her, well, 
Okay, I'll build you a fence. You gotta take that out of the amount that I pay you, but I can do that. I'll put up a fence for you. Usually when I build fences on leases, I tell a landowner, okay, I'll bring all my own fencing materials, I'll put it up, but at the end of the lease, I'm pulling it all up and taking it with me. So I use fiberglass sucker rods for fence posts. It's about that big. Real easy to take in and out by hand. But in this case, I told the landowner, okay, I'll build you a wood fence exactly the way you want it, and I'll leave it there, but we're taking that cost out of what I owe you over five years. So, I mean, I would not have preferred to do that, but that's just a what kissing I had to do in order to get this piece of property. So far, it's been a great relationship between me and them. How did you write a lease contract? My lease contracts are really simple. So here's the sections. All you need is contact info description of who you are and your farms. So mine just says, I, Ransom Cattle Company, agree to lease from this landowner at this address, this many acres, this tax parcel number, and I usually attach the aerial map with the boundaries of the lease shown on the map. So that way there's no confusion about where you're allowed to be and where you're not. Starting at end dates for the lease with the land use restrictions, I put in there that a, the landowner may not allow the land to be used or leased to any other person for any purpose that interferes with what I'm doing. And I say that if they want to sell the land during the lease period, they need to give me the first option to buy it. Or I might say that you're not allowed to sell it during this lease period, say it's like five years. That's probably the best thing to do. Liability and insurance. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on. But I just state on my land lease contract that my general liability policy does cover the landowner as additional insured. Compensation, you gotta put those details in there too. How much you owe at what time of year, annually, monthly, and however you set it up. And the fencing and supplies, who owns what? This is where I put in there that I own the fence unless otherwise stated. I own any water tanks that I bring, any water lines, any chutes, handling equipment, any machinery, any ATVs, everything is mine. You have to put that in there just to be careful. Grazing enterprise management, who controls what? I put in there that I have 100% control over what my cattle do on that land. <coughs> so that I can't be like, oh, well, you know, I don't, I don't want you putting the cattle over here, even though we agreed on that in the lease. Or, I think you need to do this with them. I think you need to feed them this. I think you need to vaccinate them with this. No, I decide what I'm doing with my cattle. Capital improvements. I was told first starting out that you should never ever make capital improvements on a landowner's property. I found that to be true in an economic sense. You can't be paying for that, but you may have to do it in a physical sense. Like I was talking about with my one landowner and building the fence for her. I probably wouldn't have gotten that lease otherwise. Termination of the lease and emergency things that might happen. I put it at the bottom of my lease that if there's an extenuating circumstance outside of my control or the landlord's control, like I get hurt or something like that, then we can renegotiate the lease or end it early and change compensation. I put something in there about drought or mass animal mortality, all these crazy things that can happen that you really think won't happen in a fight. You just kind of want to have that provision there, just to be careful. Sign it, and then my, my leases I sign in front of a notary, and I also have the option to file them on the public record of the county clerk. If I have a landowner that I don't know, or I'm kind of worried about, kind of got some weird feelings about, just do that so that at least so that there's another witness and you have proof that they signed what they signed. So, to switch gears now, talk about custom grazing. If you are a herd owner and you want to place animals with the custom grazer, <coughs> this is what you're going to look for. This is what I look for as Chow Jerry's custom grazing coordinator. So if you want Chow Jerry to send animals to you, this is what we want to see. First of all, expansion potential and scale. There's a lot of people who say, okay, I've got 30 acres of pasture, I want some animals on it. That's not going to make logistical sense for a large company. That'll work fine if you have one or two dairy heifers for your neighbor or do something a little more on a smaller or local scale. I mean, if you're not counting on this for your entire income. But in order to impress a large company, you're going to want, you want to see people with at least 100 to 200 acres of pasture that are going to be able to take about 100 cattle for us to start out with. And we want you to be able to take them all year. It's a pain in the butt to do some summer stockers and also have to find a place to put them for the winter. I mean, we might be open to negotiating some feed arrangements, but we definitely want you to be able to keep them year round. And we want you to have some potential and some drive to expand. We want you to have some plans to go find some more leases, maybe buy some more land. If you have us as a backer and a partner, you can do a lot. We want to see you take advantage of that opportunity. We want you to be a businessman. We want to know that you have a grasp on your numbers and that you kind of have an idea how business works. Not much I can say about 
about that. <laughs> Independent, self-starting kind of person. We don't want to have to hold your hand. My job as custom grazing coordinator is to give you some, is to give you management guidelines for how we want our cattle raised, but we want you to do things on time by yourself, without us having to nudge you. Like tagging and banding new calves, giving vaccinations, weaning, anything like that that has to be done. You need to have a handle on what needs to be done and do it. And be able to supply your own labor and your own equipment, your own scales. Kind of, we want to see that you are a good manager of your own farming operation. Experience the track record running livestock. We're going to probably ask you, well, what gains have you been able to put on stockers in the past? What are you capable of putting on? And it's really impressive to us when you're able to say, okay, well, I can do a pound and a half a day, but if you let me top dress the pasture with this feed or this supplement, I can get you two pounds. It takes me this amount of time, and I can do this if your cattle come in at this weight, they'll leave at this end weight. So we want to know that you have that kind of experience. Knowledge and ecosystem processes. This is a really big thing for grass-fed farms, grass-fed operations like Shell Jerry. We want to know that you care about the environment, you care about the landowner's land, and about our cattle. <coughs> so we want to know that you have some training in the way ecosystems work and the way to properly graze so that you don't mess anything up. We want to know that you share in what the landowner and the herd are really in. We want to know that you're like-minded people we have the same goals. I'm not going to have to be pulling teeth trying to get you to understand why we want to operate, why we want to do grass-fed, why we want to use a certain breed. We want to know that you're going to have more with us. We want you to have a turnkey farm. I mean, we were, most of our owners are open to, to some degree, helping a custom grazer get set up. But really, I mean, we don't want to do that. We don't, it's a big kind of pain in the butt and it ties more people down. So we want you to have a farm that's ready fenced, already watered, you already have your handling facilities in place, and it's nice if you have a trailer so that you can haul stuff around for us. The more turnkey you are, the happier we're going to be to work with you. We want you to be prepared for the winter and for bad weather, for droughts or for snow, whatever happens, we don't want you calling us and be like, oh well I can't feed your cows so you have to come pick them up. Detail and accurate record keeping. At Shell Deer, we do use the Cattle Max program on the internet for all of our animal records. And so if you sign on with us, you'll be expected to keep Cattle Max records. If you're Amish or you don't have a computer or don't want to use one, that's fine. We can work around that. But it does help if you keep records out here always as much as possible. For grazing records, we don't specify that you have to do it a certain way, but we just need to have the information that we want when we ask. Stuff about what was your recovery period or how many cattle per acre are you able to run. That kind of things. You need to have something to raise your records. And a background check. This is a new thing that we are doing now. I've heard a lot of stories from around the Northeast, people getting ripped off by custom grazers. Most of the time it is custom grazers selling animals that belong to the herd owner and saying they die. Usually one or two here and there, but there are extreme cases. So we want you to allow us to do a background check. Especially if we don't know you, we just want to know who you are. Trust that. We don't want them to micromanage every tiny little detail of everything we do. 
we want fair and timely arrival of paychecks and all other correspondence. Like if, if we call you, we want you to call back. If we email you, we want you to email back. Get back to us, don't make us wait days. And we want you to commit to our success. If you're really going to get involved with us, we want you to take care of how well we're doing. And if we need help with something here and there, we want you to help. We want you, first, we want you very importantly to be understanding when we have a problem. If we get a snowstorm, some of our water lines burst, if we get a drought, if we have an animal that gets sick, we want you not to freak out because you're doing the best you can. It happens, it's last time. Now, how to find herds to grace? Same thing pretty much as finding land to lease. Talk to absolutely everyone. Watch your ads, put out your own ads. And like we said before, going local is probably your best option to start out right down the street, but don't limit yourself to being local. There are many opportunities elsewhere in the nation where producers have different challenges. Like down south, when it gets real hot and droughty over the summer, they might want to be class animals and send them north for the summer, because we have nice, gorgeous grass in the summer. Or if out west, it's really dry out there too, they might have the same thing going on. Adverse weather, they might want to send animals to us. But be advised that if you're bringing animals from elsewhere in the country, they may not be very well adapted to our grasses and our climate here, so there might be some issues which you would want to outline in your contract. A sample of contracts. This is really not good that the protector's not working. So it's going to go through our challenge area and have great contract. We can work on it over lunch and hopefully some in the afternoon we can go over that. Daily life as a custom grazer. It is pretty much the same thing as running your own farm. <coughs> You're going to have to move your grazing herds between paddocks and between farms if necessary if you have multiple farms. Procure and provide mineral feed, anything they need to be given on a daily basis. And like I said, the direct costs for herds that I take on are always covered by the herd owner. So I'm responsible for buying the hay, getting it transported to my farm, putting it out for cows, but then I build the herd owner for it. So all they ever really have to do is send me a check. If you're doing cow calf, you'll have to be responsible for handling and for keeping accurate records on birth dates and dams and calves. So, then if we're talking about breeding, you have to proceed the bull or hand or manage the AI, whichever one you choose to do. Putting them in with the cows, taking them out of the cows, sending them back home. Sick animals, taking care of them, making sure that any animals that lose ear tags are replaced. Keeping accurate records for both grazing and animals. Weighing them whenever need be and recording weights, as specified by the owner. Keeping the owner updated. This is probably the biggest one. The owner wants to hear from you probably at least once a week. Just call and ask, just say, how are things going on your farm? This is what's happening on mine. This is how your animals are doing. Make sure that you tell them everything at the time that it happens. If you lose an animal, don't tell them one later. In our contract for Shale Jerry, it says that whenever you observe a sick animal, you need to give notice to us within six hours. And then at that point, we decide what we want to do back wise or treatment wise. But you need to tell us. We're a lot less likely to freak out on you if you tell us everything. Wrapping up, how to impress if you are a herd owner or if you are a custom grazer. How do you do well in this business? First and foremost, it's a business. You need to be a business person. You need to know numbers. If you're negotiating a custom grazing contract, if you're a grazer and you're talking to the herd owner, they don't, they don't want to pay you much. They'll pay you about five cents per head per day if you're lucky. You need to know what your rate is and you want to have a profit target in mind because that's the only way you're going to keep getting ripped off. Say that you decide you can, you can get by, you can be profitable with dairy heifers for a dollar per head per day. Ask that for an owner for a dollar ten, and then they'll try to chew you down. Kind of like buying a used car. But make sure that you know what your baseline is and don't go under it. You need to know your production goals, know the herd owner's production goals, and know what it takes to get there. What kind of feed is, what amount of time, what kind of genetics. Have a handle on what is realistic. Be ethical. Honor what you say and don't do anything that you would not want to tell the herd owner about or the custom grazer about. This is so important because otherwise you're not going to have a business. Nobody's going to come back for a second here. Be organized and be involved. Keep an open dialogue with your herd owner back and forth about what the best practices are. If you think that there's something that your herd owner could be doing better, so they tell you to do one thing and you think that you could do it better another way, tell the herd owner about it. You gotta make it a two-way street. Help them make their business better. Like I said, we want experienced people in turnkey farms. And all people who always keep learning. This is this is 
huge, no matter what you do in agriculture or really any other industry. Keep reading. There's a sample in, there's a sample in there on the stock and grass farm. It's a great magazine. I think everyone should subscribe to it. Read articles. Go to these conferences. Talk to people. Don't ever bury your head in the sand. Don't ever stop learning. There's always somebody out there doing something really cool that could be profitable for you. My contact information should be up here right now. <laughs> but if anyone is interested or ready to become a contract raiser and you think you have what it takes to work with Chow Jerry, I'd love to talk to you. I can give out my business cards and I can give out sample custom grazing contracts. I can send that to you if you want it. So hopefully we will have this AV working pretty soon and I can put that sample contract up. But in the meantime, I'll take questions. Yes, sir? Do you think people starting out in this, it's better to start like a per head basis or a per pound basis if they're trying to start a contract raising? Okay, question is, if you're starting out in contract raising, would it be better to start per head per day or per pound? I would say that from my standpoint as a custom grazer, I would want to do per head per day if you're not sure what the genetics are that you're going to be getting or what the quality of your land is, or you're not really sure if your management is is up to stuff. That way you know what your guaranteed income is going to be. But if you know you're capable of putting on like two and a two, two and a half, three pounds per head per day on a stocker, it's probably better to go with that because that's going to send a nice thing and your income is pretty much there's no cap to it. So I'd say if you're just starting out, go with a flat rate, but once you have a little more experience, transition into per head per day. Anyone else? Yeah. Or do you have uh with Shell Jerry Meats and you're marketing beef, right? Uh -huh. you're, you're hiring people to graze for you and you're, you're marketing beef. What is, first, what is the sort, what, what are your, what's your breakdown on grazing? And um, what are you seeing in terms of um, potential pushback from customers on that breakdown in grades? Breakdown in yield grades, quality grades? Quality grades. I really don't know anything about that. And the question is, what is our breakdown of the yield and quality grades in the region of Jerry Sells and what's the customer's reaction to it? That all it is, which is under the deal. He's the marketing guy. All I do is raise cows and find out people to raise cows. So I wish I could answer that. Is, is there feedback, though, from Rich to the grazers? Because it seems like I'm, I'm somebody who grazes cattle and sells beef. One of the things that I come into contact with is a customer who's looking at a carcass and saying, man, that's a lot different than the last one you brought me. Um, how am I supposed to market this? And, and so I'm learning that end of things, but I, I also value that feedback because I want to get to be a better grazier. And I'm not going to get to be a better grazier just learning about pounds of gain. I need to know what the quality is at the end. Yeah, probably where that takes you with our company is that Rich gets the feedback from the butchers and the retail people that we sell to. And then with that trickles back down to the custom grazers and the company policy that he and I set. We are trying to control all of our own genetics and standardize that so that we can get gains and parties uniformity a lot more in mind. And then we can change our production practices to make sure that we get consistent high rate of gain. And so really the contract grazers really have a lot of responsibility at least in our company from that standpoint. Their responsibility falls on me and Rich's really management and telling them what to do. And the cattle that we send them. <coughs> now, are you, these uh, uh, leases, so are they from cow calf only to a finished product, or? The Telgerian contracts are cow calf or stocker or both. So you can do any one of those three setups. And so <coughs> after the stocker phase, when the animal is about 800, 800, Pounds, they go back to our main farm in Calhoun, and then we finish them out there all under one roof. Because a lot of a lot of the people who buy from us in New York City want everything raised local, which is 200 miles from New York City for finishing, so that's why they all have to go out of Calhoun. So for us, we do podcast, Docker, or both, which we really are moving toward year-round programs for all those. Yes. Have you ever worked with like a split? You know, per per day with an incentive rider at the end of the grazing season? We haven't done that yet, but that's a very good idea. I think we're going to be going toward that. The question was, have we ever done a base rate for the second pay? We have not yet, but I think that's a great idea because it does give the custom grazer a measure of security, plus it does give them an incentive to do better and the potential for.
more extra income. I like actually the situation that Troy you have with your herd owner is getting paid a higher rate in the grazing season versus the season when you're feeding hay because that incentivizes you to keep grazing and to manage your pastures better so that you can get the highest percentage of days of the year in grazing rather than feeding hay. Yes, sir. Okay, Meg. Um, what percentage of your grazers who are going to be feeding are um, responsible for providing hay versus child dairy buying hay, buying feed for them, similar to what I guess Brian's done? It's kind of a, it is an issue that um, between child dairy and Brian our own contract, we are haggling about. Child dairy likes to just pay people at hay season rate and have them buy all their own hay. I use Rhinestone, I don't make any hay, so we have to come up with a different arrangement. But normally if we pay a dollar per head per day for a cow and a cow calf pair, calf is included with the cow. And then during the hay season for people who make their own hay, we pay them a dollar eighty and then they're responsible for providing the hay. But if you don't make your own hay, then that's that's a different consideration. We have to work through individually. Are you sorry? Yes, we're ready. Uh, is in terms of the, the winter feeding, are you looking, you and meaning Chuck Jerry, looking at the, the, I mean, are you looking at feed analysis? Well, on on baleage, hay, I mean, there, there's a variety. There's a lot of differences. The question is, are we doing feed analysis and using that for our winter feeding? Yes, we've done a lot of that this year, getting all of our hay tested before we buy it and doing hay tests throughout the winter to make sure our cattle, what is actually going in their mouth, is still of adequate quality. We are experimenting with fodder, so we're hoping to move toward that as a pretty big part of our winter feeding program. The forage test just came on that. Our FB was 300 something, so that could be really cool things for us. Hey, look, slideshows all the way up. Let me try and get this contract up so you can talk us through that. I, I got a question. What, what's fodder? Fodder is grass that you grow like in a greenhouse. It comes out as a oh, big okay. mat, almost like sod. Sprout, you sprout, and sprout. It the cows. So it's basically sod. So for, um, again, in your packet, there's some contracts in there. Um, what I can do also, um, for those that have email, I'm going to scan all those documents. There's other folks that couldn't be here um, on an email packet. Um, so so um, I actually have Meg's contract on my computer. Um, if you're interested in seeing the, the seeing it. Um, so well, it's called the peanuts lunchtime. So enjoy lunch, everybody. Thank you. Whatever. It's always the food. 